Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to episode four of Informed and Engaged. The novel coronavirus has accelerated both the positive and negative trends that have been changing the local media landscape. That means that decisions that we make today will have a huge impact on what local news looks like in the coming years. Today, we are delighted to bring you three rock star news leaders who will tell us why they recently over made career choices so that they could play a larger role in nonprofit news. At Knight Foundation, we are dedicated to providing the resources and the networks and the connections to support a future of journalism, for journalism. And we are also thrilled to work with so many people who are looking to increase impact in journalism. And today, I am so delighted uh, that we will have a conversation with Stacy Marie Ishmael, who recently left Apple Hi. Uh, in November of 2019 to take on a new role as editorial director at the Texas Tribune. And with Stacy at the Texas Tribune is Millie Tran, who also, who also just uh, left the New York Times to take on an exciting new role for the Texas Tribune. And Neil Chase, who formerly led the Mercury News in San Jose and news organizations across the Bay Area that, and while he was there, won a Pulitzer for the horrific, for their coverage, for the horrific fire in Oakland. And in the last year, Neil Chase um, also made the decision to take on a new role in nonprofit news as the head of Cal Matters. So today with these three people, we have news leaders who are responsible for one fifth of the nation's population in terms of helping ensure that they are informed and engaged. So I am thrilled uh, to have Stacy, Millie, and Neil here with us this afternoon. So Stacy and Millie, you both work together at BuzzFeed. So Stacy, yep. first, please tell us um, what drew you uh, to the Texas Tribune. And, uh, and then Millie, let's hear from you. Sure. Um, when, I, when I left my rule in November, I, I left for two, knowing that I wanted to do one of two things. One was go back into a newsroom or sort of double down on research into misinformation and disinformation, uh, because those are like, that's something I've been really interested in and passionate about for a long time. And so as I was thinking about what the options were, sometime not too long after I had left, I got a, a Twitter message from Evan Smith, who's the CEO of the Texas Tribune, being like, hey, I hear we should talk to you <laughs> um, in the context of the needing to fill the role of editorial director after the recent departures of Emily Ramshaw and uh, Amanda Zamora, who have, of course, started the, the 19th. And so we started talking and I confessed to him that, you know, I've been interested in the Tribune for a while. I had followed various of the reporters who had been very early and very aggressive on things like maternal health and elections and particularly voter suppression. And the Tribune really fit my criteria of a news organization that was doing interesting things, that was doing interesting things well, that was covering a state that I felt, having also lived in New York and California, which are convinced they are the only states that matter, um, but it was also a state that was, you know, important at the national level and in and of itself, right? You know, there are so many people in Texas and from Texas, and Texas is such a large part of the conversation about education or the economy. And it was a real opportunity to take what I had learned in various of the other settings and contexts that I'd worked in and use those things to help, you know, take the Tribune into its next decade. Um, much of what Stacy said actually is uh, the same for me. You know, I, I grew up in California. San Jose is my hometown, Neil. Yeah. I'm currently in New York, stuck here. Um, and, you know, Texas, as 
I've talked with Evan about, it's, it's a state of superlatives. I like reading the list of all those things, the biggest producer of crude oil, the most citizens in prison, the most people living without health care, the longest border in Mexico. There are just so many stories. And I think, you know, similar to what Stacey said, there was such a strong foundation that Evan Smith and the rest of the team built over these first 10 years that I felt it was a really exciting opportunity to kind of take it to um, its next decade and using kind of all of um, the range of experiences and skills and to work with one of my best friends. <laughs> that is a real pleasure. Oh Wonderful to have you back together again. And before we complete this conversation, you will have to tell us what it is like to work day in and day out with the singular force, the great Evan Smith. Um, Neil, Neil, so you were running a rather large uh, news organization um, in California. And of course, we had an opportunity to work together at the New York Times um, uh, some years, years ago. And then you took a fascinating turn um, in that you, you really plunged into the business of journalism. Dark side. Yeah. Yes. No, no, it's... it's I would disagree with that characterization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Side. Yeah. So tell us a, a little bit about what you did after the left, after you left the New York Times, working with John Patel, why you took the role at the San Jose uh, Mercury News and, yeah. and the news organizations up and down. Yeah, I, I left the Times to go to a company called Federated Media that was working with bloggers. And, you know, bloggers were perhaps the original you know, small or maybe nonprofit news organization, right? An individual person with, with great expertise and an audience. And they went out on their own to run their own publication of, of sorts. And a lot of them had, you know, brilliant minds for the content they were doing, but hadn't figured out the business side yet. So Federated Media was created to help them build a business side. And for me, it was a crash course in advertising and marketing and product and perhaps even more importantly, thinking about the entire organization as one holistic organization, right? Most of the news organizations I'd been in before that were so large that even at a, at a management level, you might have some interaction with people who were bringing in the revenue, but not enough. And uh, this was really, it was a startup. It was you know, high speed and fun and right in the middle of all the, the marketing uh, work that we had to do. And that, after about five years of doing that, I went out on my own and started doing some consulting work. We had built the business of content marketing, did a lot of research and work in that field, um, helped some publishers build new ad models, new revenue models. And then uh, the Mercury News reached out and was looking for somebody who could be the editor, but who could also figure out what role the, the newsroom has to play in the financial future of the organization. And on my first day, I... Uh, ingratiated myself with the staff by saying, look, I hate to tell you all this, but you're all product managers now. And it took a while for some people to, to kind of wrap their arms around that. But we were able to turn the newsroom into a bunch of people who understood that we have to run a business here and we will run the business by doing great journalism and then figuring out how to get it to people and how to get them to pay for it. And those things are not separate. I learned a ton and I was working with as you said, you know, they won a Pulitzer Prize. All I did was show up to work and the staff did amazing work, you know, day in and day out, especially on that story. And it's the hardest working people who, you know, no matter what's going on in the financial side are still dedicated to doing a great job covering their community. And it was a, it was a tremendous experience and I learned, you know, more than I possibly could have imagined. And then, um, uh, uh, this is going to be terrible for Evan's ego, but I too had, a, had Evan involved in my, in my decision making because I spent about an hour talking to Evan about the Texas Tribune before I took the Cal Matters job. Um, and uh, I, I too had a fascination with what they were doing and what they were able to build and the kind of work they were able to do. And when I was invited to talk to Cal Matters, it just seemed like a tremendous opportunity, not just to cover stories, but to, to really you know, rebuild journalism in California. So we're going to come back uh, to you, uh, Neil, later in the conversation about the role of not-for-profits in generating revenue, because many folks think, oh, it's a not-for-profit, generating revenue is not my job. But of course, that's not, that's not the case at all. And it would be just really interesting to hear how you have um, transferred some of the lessons from um, 
working with John Battelle and working at the Mercury News. So Stacy, so at Apple, you were senior editor with broad editorial oversight and, and, and control. What is it that working not only at BuzzFeed, but at Apple, uh, what is it that you learned that you think will best be helpful to not only the Texas Tribune, but, but local journalism across the country? Yeah, um, it's an interesting thing to have an audience of a billion people <laughs> and, you know, a kind of a big, a big responsibility, but it makes you think about all the ways that there are certain messages that are broadly universal and then there are things that are hyper specific. And I think one of the interesting challenges for local is understanding and balancing that you know, we want to talk about things that are immediately, urgently, super relevant to a particular community. And we want a broad base of people who may or may not directly belong to that community to be engaged by, interested in, and supportive of the work, right? And that those two things don't have to work in like contradiction to each other, that they're actually highly complementary. So I'd say that that sort of daily lesson in um, this is interesting and this is going to be interesting only in Korea or this is going to be interesting in, you know, a hundred more countries. How do we know, how do we package what are sometimes like the same kinds of stories? You, you Sometimes you change the art, sometimes you change the headline, sometimes you change the lead anecdotes. And I think there's a lot of interesting lessons there for, for local media. I think the second thing really that I learned and really, really appreciate every single day is the importance of design and the user experience. And this is something that, as you know, I have been very much uh, a broken record on for a super long time. But being in an environment that filters almost every decision through, is this a good experience for the person using it, was just like an invaluable education in how to think really deeply around it's not only about the headline, it's not only about the photo, it's not only about the art, it's like how fast does the website load, right? Like how easy is it for the people to find what they're looking for? Like Millie and I have this conversation all the time, which is obviousness is not the enemy, right? Like make it really easy for folks to find what they are looking for. And I think the challenge for a lot of local media organizations is we have internalized that design has to be very expensive and that this isn't something we can afford and that user experience is only for people who have entire product teams with 30 people on them. And, you know, the reality is there are a lot of fairly straightforward things that we can think about, adapt, adopt, that would be a really meaningful benefit to our audiences. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm going to have to dig up that excellent presentation that you made to Lightning Talk that you made to News Guys a couple of years ago. Long time ago. Oh yeah. my goodness. Oh my goodness. And you called it then about the dreadful uh, user experience that so many people now have um, with local news organizations. Um, and national with their ones news too. experience and national <laughs> ones too. And yeah. national ones ones too. And Millie, so joining the Texas Tribune um, from the New York Times and having worked uh, with Stacy at BuzzFeed, what are some of the lessons that, that or what are some of the best practices um, that you'll be bringing to the Texas Tribune? Well, before I talk about the Times, just to go back a little bit in time to BuzzFeed, but not with Stacy, which was when I was global uh, director of global adaptation, which is another job we made up. Um, but it was all about it was all about identifying what does well in one of BuzzFeed's uh, I think at the time eleven non English editions and seeing how we can translate and adapt it across um, kind of the network of sites and I think understanding that um, how you make a thing and deliver it to people was such a simple and like um, powerful insight yeah it was a powerful lesson. Um, that that doesn't have to just be on like a global market level, right? You you can scale it up and down and how you understand that. Um, so that was an unintentional kind of uh, benefit. And very similar to what Stacey was saying about her lessons from Apple, right? It's about, um, I, I'm gonna jump around here, um, but I was just actually talking to a class. Stacey, I think it was your class. <laughs> it was my class. <laughs> a couple weeks ago. And you know, I was asked to, 
um, describe. So it, in my role, uh, I oversee our audience, engineering, data, design, marketing, and loyalty teams. And I was asked to explain audience and product. And I think I like hate those two terms so much because they're so broad that they're almost useless. And Neil, to your point about like trying to get a newsroom to understand product. Um, and I remember in my interviews with the Texas Tribune and uh, this segment with our uh, reporters and editors, them asking me like, what does like, they keep telling us to like bring product thinking. Like, what does that mean? And I said like the easiest way I can describe audience and product to people is like making things for people. And I think like, again, like simplicity and kind of the easiest way to understand something is not the enemy. And it actually is very clarifying. And once you get that, like the news is the product, right? And yep. the audience is your, your, the people. Um, so I, like, I think those two things are really simple, but really important lessons that, again, sound so obvious. Um, but, you know, just now to go back to the times, just what I learned at the times, uh, I'll list out, it's just what it takes to work in a world-class newsroom at the top of its game. I, I don't think, like, it, not an hour goes by that someone doesn't share like a New York Times Slack link or a link in Slack, right? Um, and whether that's like being intentional and strategic, applying the best qualitative and quantitative data, or what's really important too is just being fiercely competitive and protective of its brand. Um, yep. So that's a fun thing that I get to work on now with um, Natalie, who leads our marketing and comms. So. Fun. Absolutely. And Millie, speaking of um, famous presentations and memos, and I saw it shared again this morning. So if you wouldn't mind sharing in the chat the wonderful guide that you have provided to people on how to, how to think about a new role new job and um and i'm sure you uh maybe looked at that memo that you wrote and that it <laughs> has benefited so many people it's, it's um, very sadly called what am i going to do with my life yeah what Indeed. am i going to do with my life um via millie tran it's a gem it's a gem so we'll share it in the chat and we'll uh share it um on twitter after after this this conversation so, Neil, not-for-profits, why do not-for-profits have to generate revenue? And what is it that you're bringing from your experience um, in San Jose and working with John Patel um, in generating revenue? And what are the uh, major sources of revenue for not-for-profit news organizations today? It's fascinating because people are, are rightfully focused on, on not-for-profits and, and the, the, the potential of them. But in, in a lot of cases, there's not much difference between a nonprofit and a you know, small to medium-sized news organization, a small business running a news organization. You're trying to make enough money, whether it's coming from the readers or coming from sponsors and advertisers, or whether it's coming from uh, philanthropy and, and major donors. And you're trying to use that money to do journalism and pay the people who do it. Um, and unless you're owned by a large, horrible hedge fund, um, the money you make goes back into the business, right? E either way. And the, the thing about a nonprofit is, I think in our case, and in many cases, they're started by one person or a small group of people who think this is important. In our case, there was somebody who thought the coverage is missing from the state capitol. We've lost that. Somebody is very involved in journalism, our, our founder, Simone Cox. She had the resources to get it started and the, the contacts with people to get it going. And it's now up to us to take that initial start and make it into a more robust news organization. So the Tribune's done an amazing, and the Tribune is twice as old as us. We've learned a ton from the Texas Tribune over the years, um, partially because you steal from the best and partially because they are so giving about sharing everything about, about the business and how it works. Um, and you know, they, what they've done and what we are working on doing is changing the model so that whatever was your original revenue source, you're getting other sources as well. You're building an events business. You're building up new kinds of sponsorships. You're finding ways to run the business. And the biggest challenge, I think, is to get the entire organization on the same page about 
how and why we run the business and what the goals are. And so the, you know, the Mercury News, these conversations we had about, here's our circulation, here's where it's going, we've got to do something about this or we're going to go away and the community is going to lose its journalism. There, there were some wins across the board, but there are also these fascinating individual conversations where somebody says, I've been thinking about that and I've been thinking about what I cover and I think there's another way to do this. And I think there's another audience for this and, and a product we could build out of this. And you don't need everybody thinking that way, but when more people in the organization are thinking that way and when you can get everybody thinking about the same, the same metrics, the same goals, the same North Star, we announced some new positions last week. And when I showed uh, some folks on the board our new org chart, their first question was, okay, but who's responsible for audience? And the answer, of course, was everybody's responsible for audience. The only reason we do this is, is for the people who we're serving. Um, and so the question becomes, what's each person's role in building that audience? But just changing the way we think and getting everybody focused on the whole model, the whole thing we have to do. It used to be that you wrote a story and went to the bar. Right, that was, that was journalism. Um, once your story was filed, you were done. And we have to get everybody engaged in the conversation about who's reading it and why and how. And getting everybody engaged in the conversation is critical for journalism to survive. And we have seen, of course, with the Black Lives Movement, the uh, growing, um, important, critical, crucial conversation about the role of journalism in dismantling systemic racism and the role that journalism has played in upholding systemic racism. So as leaders of not-for-profit news organizations, um, two of the most successful and largest in the country, um, what, what opportunities do you see um, for your organizations to lead in this area, to address the crucial, critical concerns about the role of journalism in dismantling systemic racism? I can, I can start on this. I mean, at a baseline, and this is something you would have heard from Millie as well as me, the only way to change our coverage is to change what we look like, right? It's like there's, it is an utterly pointless exercise to be like, let's write different stories when, you know, 90% of your newsroom is white dudes. And I think this is a real problem for local media. If you, there are a lot of people starting them right now, but when you look at the team pages and you look at the staff pages, we are very much replicating models that have, you know, been true in media for generations and where you are undermining our message about being mission driven and community focused when we don't look anything like the communities that we say that we are serving and that and it's very difficult for our mission to actually line up with what we're saying and so certainly one of the things that the tribune that's a focus and that you know the tribune was on the record as saying this in its strategic plan long before millie and i got here is you know we have to take the uh, we have to have a workforce that represents Texas and Texas is an incredibly not homogenous place <laughs> by, by any metric that you might imagine. And so if our newsroom doesn't look like Texas, then our newsroom can't represent Texas, right? So that's certainly an area that we are taking super seriously and will continue to um, forever pretty much. And then I think the other part is what do you cover and whose voices do you elevate, right? So if you have the right people in place, who are making and leading coverage decisions, what kinds of stories are you telling? I think one of the more interesting discussions that came out of the past couple of months was for the first time, a lot of people realized the extent to which statements by police are not always accurate. And that's something that a handful of reporters, including Wesley Lowry and various other folks who went to Ferguson and have been and have been reporting on these things for a long time, have been like screaming at the top of their lungs for ages. But it isn't something that we were able to broadly convince, um, you know, our own newsrooms and the rest of the industry, right? And then suddenly there were video recordings, you know, reporters broadcasting live, being shot at with rubber bullets or tackled to the floor or arrested with their press badges out. And it's not so much about who was being arrested. It was about the fact that this was so visible and so obvious and so overt that when, you know, half an hour later, there was a statement like, oh, we didn't use tear gas. And everyone was like, no, we saw the tear gas. 
you know, that, that, that I think allowed people who have worried about will this upset the status quo to have a way in, um, even if they didn't necessarily have the courage or conviction to do that before. That's right. We, um, you, know, you, you think about this on a couple of different levels, right? There's the internal, how are we constituted to Stacey's point, if you don't look like the people you're covering, you can't do a good job of covering the community. And then there's the external. Our job, both at the Tribune and at Cal Matters, is to hold at least state government and, and to some degree local authorities uh, accountable and transparent. And so if news organizations are going to do that, then what you're covering is the institutions and the, the institutional structures that allow you know, long-term uh, institutional racism and how to break that down. It's a huge journalistic challenge. And I think it's frankly, it's as important externally and internally. It's a little, you, you can look at the internal scope and understand it more quickly than it is to figure out where are these structures in a giant government like the governments of Texas or California. Um, internally, we, California and Texas are very much similar, right? Tremendously diverse um, and changing very rapidly, uh, growing rapidly. Um, we, our, our organization is 43% people of color at, at Cal Matters, which is a higher percentage than some organizations, but California is 66%. So we got a ways to go until we really reflect the, the state that we're covering. What's really energized me in the past two months is the way that our staff has stepped up and said, you know, we, as a staff, we own this. We, the staff has created committees to look at hiring issues at the pipeline for new candidates, style issues and things like that. Um, we're looking at some things that are internal structures that definitely have the potential to, to perpetuate racism, things like the, the annual review structure, the way you do raises and, and uh, classifying people, the hiring pipeline, um, a lot of things internally to look at. And then we've been on a, a two year project to document and, and understand the solutions to income inequity in California. And a lot of these same structural issues we have to look at externally or statewide. So we have a lot of work to do. And Neil, I think one thing that Cal Manners is doing, which is very, very um, positive, is really helping support the local um, community um, and ethnic news organizations. Because there is such an opportunity for um, organizations like the Texas Tribune and Cal Matters to, um, to to be the hub, you know, of a network of um, smaller organizations serving their communities. We've seen great success, for example, in Philadelphia um, with, with the role that, that Resolve has played. And Billy, you had, um, we had, had talked the other day about um, the role of collaboration. Yeah. And that is just one of the major differences and major opportunities that you're seeing um, in your new role in not-for-profit news. So tell us more. Yeah, so the Texas Tribune has a policy where anyone is free to republish any of our journalism. Um, so we, we got a note from another Texas publisher a few weeks ago. Uh, oh, yeah, it was so nice. One of our um, stories about the hospitalizations in Texas. Um, and it said, because your journalists cover the state so thoroughly, I can keep my focus on reporting the news at the local level. So again, just to like reiterate the people and kind of internal resources, resourcing aspect of this, there's also this broader kind of ecosystem um, part. And we, we actually just got another uh, note a few weeks ago, or a few days ago saying, about one and a half years ago, my husband and I bought a small community newspaper in Northeast Texas. Since we have a very small staff, there's obviously no way to cover such a big state. So it's great that Texas Tribune provides content, which helps us smaller community papers. So I, I just really believe that a collaborative ecosystem is the future, well, present. Um, and Heather Bryant actually- uh, Oh, thank you. I was gonna say up. like yeah. Heather Bryant is the OG on journalism yeah. collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> um, do the work of journalism as part of a collaborative ecosystem rather than a competitor in a market is the best way to strategically use limited resources, ensure depth and breadth of coverage, and center decisions on community news needs. So I think all this kind of works together as a system, right? And I think the limited resources is really important. It's allowing people to kind of cover their own niche, allowing cover 
people to focus on different levels. Um, so I, I just think a collaborative ecosystem is the present. Yeah, and I mean, collaboration across, like obviously we allow people to republish our, our stories, but we have also through RevLab, for example, which is about to launch its very first um, events cohort, which is really a, a training program for other media organizations with a you know preference for local media organizations, particularly ones serving diverse communities to understand, hey, here's what we learned with our events business and particularly an events business that had to shift hard in March <laughs> to, to going entirely online. And so there are opportunities to give back across like all kinds of levels of expertise, of thinking, of business strategy, of you know folks teaming up on um, what CMS should I use? Like I just think that there's so much information that is often very siloed and these opportunities don't need to be as siloed as they currently are. Yeah, so it, it extends beyond just coverage, right? It's about kind of systems and processes and decisions and how do we kind of reduce the friction for other people to do news. That's mm -hmm. music to our, to our ears. Uh, so we'd love to, um, to get your questions, um, folks joining us on the call for uh, Millie and Stacy Marie and, and Neil. And one, um, one very important question, um, and it was addressed today in a Neiman Lab post, is about the rise of hyperpartisan um, Hyper partisan, as in nonpartisan, uh, news organizations across the country, and a very disturbing um, trend that um, we've seen too in Florida, Wisconsin, and other states where news organizations um, stating that they're nonprofit, nonpartisan, are funded by, uh, by progressive supporters who are not uh, transparent about where the money's coming from. And so one of the questions that we have from Willie Schubert is, how do you keep separation between the business and news side of your organization? And yep. how do you address, how do you address uh, transparency and partisanship at a time when uh, news organizations are becoming increasingly partisan? So I would, there, I would slightly distinguish between folks that are engaging in hyperpartisan misinformation and disinformation, which is an industry and a highly profitable one in and of itself. And that in addition to being run by particular groups, whatever their political affiliation, are often run by people who have zero political affiliation, couldn't even vote in an election in the US, um, but have figured out that there are ways to monetize types of content that people will be very, you know, having a very strong emotional response to. Um, that, that is a failure of the information ecosystem and something that like we could do a whole different session on. But as, as it relates to financial incentives in newsrooms, like I, my, my first real reporting job was at the Financial Times and we were, were a financial news organization and I was always fascinated by the extent to which even in the context of a news organization that specifically reported on business finance and economics, the newsroom at the time was, you know, very happy having no idea um, how, like, how we made money, <laughs> right? But people who would have very strong opinions on things like distribution times and whether the paper on a Saturday showed up at 8 a.m. or 10 a.m. And I was like, this is the same conversation. If you care about distribution, if you care about the trucks and the printing presses, then you care about how we pay the people who drive the trucks and run the printing presses. And so often this conversation about how we separate those two, like, operates from this place of a assuming that understanding how the business works means you're going to be unduly and nefariously influenced somehow and give inappropriate amounts of power to usually in this case advertisers or sponsors right and i think that in increasingly it's really important to understand that not knowing how things work puts you in a worse position because you are not having useful conversations with the folks who are pitching you on contracts. You are not informed about the risks and the opportunities and you're not making decisions that then are going to inform like how do we need to be thinking about our newsroom right if you if you don't know what your financial position is you don't know how many people you can hire in the next 12 months or that you can't hire in the next 12 months and if you don't understand why we are in the middle of an advertising recession and how that might affect 
your newsroom, you are not in a position to make sure that you are taking all appropriate steps to shore yourselves up against even worse conditions. So I've long been of the belief that it is possible and actually it is the responsibility of newsroom leaders to not just want to know about, but to like be an active participant in the conversation around how our newsrooms stay or get sustainable in any environment. You said that so well. I mean, Absolutely. this is not a new problem, right? We, we, forever, advertisers have tried to influence editorial. And in the old days, the publisher would meet the advertisers at the country club, and then the publisher would try to say something to the editors, maybe overtly or not. And it would be up to the editors to kind of you know, referee that and keep some of that influence out of the newsroom. The best way you keep the journalism high quality and accountable and transparent is, first of all, by hiring high quality journalists. And secondly, by having that transparent conversation, it doesn't matter if your newspaper 100 years ago was mostly you know, funded by Macy's and now your news organization is mostly funded by a group of nonprofit foundations. Either way, there's always money behind or just the owner of the publication. The owners of some of the publications and some of the for-profit publications in America today are just terrible people with very one-sided political beliefs. It's about how you operate in that arena and how transparent you can be. And one nice thing about a nonprofit is that you can be completely transparent uh, to a ridiculous extent, which helps, I think, a lot with people trusting our work. Absolutely. I think with with our transparency, we also have to be accessible, right? Because like, if you're the kind of person like me who will like read 990s, then, <laughs> then of course, like nonprofit financials are super, are super transparent. I think there's, there is a difference between the availability of that information and helping our audiences like really understand what those things mean. Yeah, and I, I will just note there that we go out of our way to be as transparent and accessible as possible, whether that's who donates us, who funds us, who our members are. Um, so, yep. yep. And right now there is a pretty uh, robust debate about the role of, of journalism and questions around the role of journalists as activists and advocates. And do you see any um, change in um, journalism ethics and principles um, around transparency, around, um, around the role of journalists um, in not-for-profit organizations? I think when people talk about activism in the context of journalism, it's often actually a conversation about like, what status quo are you happy for us to hold up? And, you know, going back to the example of reporting about police, it was fascinating to me that when we reported on, for instance, the Austin Police Department using force on protesters, we got a string of emails, comments, etc. being like, how can you be so biased against the police for like the mere fact of saying, this is a thing that happened, right? And so we have as an industry for a super long time, internalized a very particular definition of who you're allowed to challenge and that's okay because that counts as objectivity you know like way back in 2014 when folks were talking about the fact that merely quoting a presidential candidate's statements is increasingly journalistic malpractice when those statements are in fact imaginary um, or elusive at best and that not contextualizing that for your audiences is not in fact providing a degree of transparency or, or objectivity right and so our understanding of the what is often weaponized as an accusation particularly among journalists from like black and brown communities is that talking about things that make other people uncomfortable and reporting on those things accurately and fairly is not the same thing as you know being an activist or having a partisan position for a cause it's just actually doing our jobs better yeah and yes. to add one more thing about the framing around you know diversity and objectivity as like a social justice issue when it's really a matter of journalism and making our journalism better and a more accurate reflection of our reality so yep yes absolutely and you know, look at the difference that data-driven journalism can make. And of course, um, Millie and Stacy, early days, you were also very much involved in user-generated content and the incredible increasing role that video and from user 
generated content um, creates. Yeah. I mean, data journalism is a really good example of something that is like not at all neutral, right? Like what, which data sets you pick, how you describe that data yep. sets, like how you filter them, how you slice mm -hmm. them, you can get, you can make data tell you anything you want. And, and I think that when you have, when we as an industry have like relied on official sources for data sets, like we're seeing this with coronavirus right now, right? Like how many people of, from particular communities have died? is you would think the world's most straightforward if depressing question that you know we need to be rewarding on and the reality is it's like a very very hard question to get an answer to because that data is either not available or available only in pdfs that you cannot scrape or available only if you call a hundred different counties <laughs> every single day to get updates right and so that i think is a really good example of something and i think data journalists have been prone to this for a long time of believing in the inherent neutrality of a practice without interrogating all of the ways that every decision that we make is actually very consequential. That's so Absolutely. true and applies to every story that's ever been written, right? Nobody, nobody left the scene of a car crash when they covered it to go interview the junkyard dealer to see if he was happy there'd be two more wrecked cars in town. Like you, you pick your story angles and you try to tell the story in a way that's meaningful to the society and the community. And if we're lifting a little bit of this fantasy that there's something called you know, objective journalism, that every, every journalist is just a robot with no feelings, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think objective journalism is, to Millie's point, the process of the reporting, right? Like, are you taking every possible step and then 10 more to make sure that you are interrogating your own assumptions as well as those of the folks that you are reporting on? Um, Tom Rosensteel, who's the executive director of the American Press Institute and who I worked closely with, there had a great thread on kind of the history of objectivity in journalism and how it is in fact about the process of how we do yep. journalism, not about the individual. So I, I can share that. Yeah, actually, I was speaking with Tom earlier today, and we were talking about his uh, Twitter thread, which got almost a million engagements on Twitter. So we'll also uh, share that later on social and in the chat. So we have a question from um, Damian Thorman in Colorado, where the Colorado uh, journalists and funders um, are supporting a new uh, collab, a new uh, mm -hmm. news collaborative. And his uh, question is, do participants, do, um, do any of you have any advice from uh, your experience to, uh, to deepen their programs and strategies? Yeah, th this is a time when, you know, the, the, with the Tribune with their Revenue Lab, right, they have taken the practice of being nice about sharing their lessons and turned it into a thing with a name and a business and people assigned to it, which is wonderful. But we're at a point right now where so many news organizations are closing down in a panic because of the economy and the virus and, and the pandemic that we have to take some emergency action, right? So in California, we've raised almost $2 million now to take a number of the smaller, primarily ethnic and local community organizations, some of the, the, the black newspapers, the, the, the publishers that are in uh, languages other than English and give them some emergency help, not just cash, but we're gonna fix your business model. We'll set up your website and your email and stuff like that. Take all the things off your plate that you can't deal with so you can just do the news. I think anybody who's trying to organize groups of journalists locally now has to find ways to take out the friction. So all they have to do is the local reporting and editing and some marketing in order to keep some of this community journalism alive. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back to Heather Bryant because she said something the other day that really stuck with me, which is she's like, everybody is looking for better ways to get involved in collaboration and nobody's asking how they can be better collaborators. And I think that really comes at the heart of some of these issues, which is like, yeah, we, we all want to join the thing. Like, yay, let's, let's all collaborate. But how easy it is, is it to work with us? Like, how easy are we making it for folks to, you know, get, get access to that information that we're sharing through things like RevLab? How easy is it for folks to even know that these opportunities exist? And I think one of the real challenges that we have is we have like a seriously fragmented network of people doing yes. individually interesting stuff. And if you were to try to keep up with every one of those things, like you, it becomes your full-time job, right? So like, what is, what is the filter on top of those that can help someone make better and more informed decisions when we're operating in a like information dense, but time poor environment? Yes, absolutely. And that's a huge challenge. And we have some resources that we'll share. 
with folks um, after today's show. Thank you very much, Stacy, Neil, and Millie for joining us today for such an important conversation. And for anyone interested in starting your own not-for-profit news site, uh, there has been, oh my goodness, uh, 67, 60, 70 new nonprofit news organizations that have started in just the last couple of years. And so we put a link in the chat to the Institute for not for profit News where there's uh, pathways and resources and guides uh, to get you started. And we are so thankful that we have uh, Stacy, Millie, and Neil to um, help lead the way with great new products and great new ideas and great new ways to ensure that journalism is keeping all communities informed and engaged. Thank you for joining us. A pleasure. Thanks so much for having us.